Uh, hi everyone, thank you for coming. My name is Cristina Vazquez. I'm the president of FECUSA Boston. And uh, I would like to start thanking Paco and uh, Victoria for hosting this event at the Instituto Cervantes tonight. And uh, I also have to thank our sponsors, Fundación Ramon Areces and FECIT, the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology, for supporting this event. And of course, our panelists, Mark, Tari, Cesar, and Rachel, for attending tonight, and our moderator, Marta. They are going to talk about a very interesting and very hot topic in the scientific field right now, CRISPR. But before that, I would like to talk a little bit about ECUSA, who we are and what is what we do. In ECUSA, we have three main goals. The first one is to promote science outreach, to expose the work developed by Spanish professionals in the US. We also have some programs in education where we want to inspire the future generations. And we have some workshops to promote career and networking opportunities for these professionals. Currently, we have five different chapters, and we are represented in more than 30 states in the US with over 600 members. I'm going to talk briefly about some of the programs and events that we have in the agenda for this year. We have some science outreach seminars, like the one that we are hosting tonight, and they are called ECUSA Science Nights. We also have the education program ECUSA en las Escuelas, where we bring volunteers to the schools here in Cambridge to talk about their jobs in Cambridge and in Boston. ECUSA Entre Culturas aims to connect schools from here, from the US, with schools from Spain to promote cultural exchange. We have some workshops for professional development. We actually have one uh, already planned for June. Uh, it's going to be about leadership. If you're interested, uh, you can find more information on our website. We have different mentoring programs to help you in your career at different levels. And networking events. They are called Ciencia y un Jamón, and here we meet at some bars in the Cambridge area, and we just drink, we just drink some beers and exchange experiences, and it's very casual. ECUSA Experts Guide. This is a document where we collect the information of all our full members, and the, the goal is for people in the media and other private and public institutions to be able to, to find you and collaborate with you. In e-visibility, if you have published a paper or if you have a patent, we can uh, interview you and publish um, these results in our media. And we also have seminars with the Spanish universities. And everyone working in ECUSA, we are all volunteers. So we do this for the love of science and to help people. And as you can see, we do a lot of things. So if you want to volunteer in any of these programs or if you have any other ideas, please contact us. And we'll be more than happy to have you in the team. Our contact information is uh, boston at ecusa.es. And uh, you have our website there. And also, if you want to further support ECUSA's project, you can become a full member. It's only $30 per year, and there are different advantages associated with this status. You can be part of the board of directors. You can vote in the upcoming elections. And then you have also some discounts with uh, Piccolo, it's an attorney buffet, Iberico Club, or the uh, magazine Principia. And I would like to talk briefly about our next uh, workshop. It's going to be about immigration options. We are going to have the lawyer Javier Pico from Pico Law. He's going to talk about different visas and the green card and how to start a company here in the US. And it's going to be on April 18th. You can find all the information in our website. And now I'm going to hand it over to Marta Murcia, who is the moderator of this panel. Thank you so much, Christina. Thank you, guys. Welcome, everyone. As we'll, we'll share with the panelists. Uh, come on in, guys. How is everyone doing? Thank you for the rather long wait. My name is Marta Murcia. I'm part of the events uh, 
team here for ECUSA, and I also work as an academic research manager for Roche, the pharmaceutical company. And it is my pleasure to welcome to you to welcome you today. Let me start before I introduce the esteemed panelists today by asking you how many of you have heard about CRISPR or gene editing before? Is this how many hands? Okay, many. I guess we have an educated audience. That's great because I would really like this to be very interactive. We have some questions that we have prepared to really guide the discussion, but please feel free to raise your hand, express also, share your experiences with the technology, and we'll, we'll play it by ear. I want this to be very interactive, so thank you in advance for participating. Um, let me start by introducing the panelists tonight. We have uh, Rachel uh, Satch, She's an academic fellow at the Pet Petri Plum Center for Health Law Policy, uh, Biotechnology, and Bioethics at Harvard Law School. She trained in both law and bioethics, and her research focuses on questions of innovation policy as it relates to both of these fields. We have next, Cesar de la Fuente. is a postdoctoral associate at MIT. Cesar obtained his PhD in microbiology and immunology at the University of British Columbia. Cesar investigates novel approaches to tackle the global health problems of antibiotic resistance. Up next is Rosario Fernandez Godina. Godina, we call her Chari, so I will be uh, uh, naming her Chari. Chari is a molecular and cellular biologist Currently, she is a research fellow in ophthalmology at the Mass Eye and Ear here in, in Boston, where she studies the early stages of macular degeneration for potential therapeutic development. And la uh, last but not least, uh, we have Mark Well. He's a BIS Technology Development Fellow at Harvard University, where he focuses on synthetic systems to generate human compatible tissues and technologies for genome engineering and recoding. So welcome the, the panelists. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I guess we all know what CRISPR-Cas is, the revolution that really has generated in the biotechnology. But we would like to start by overviewing, and I see many of you already know or have heard about it. But we are going to get started with an overview. Mark is going to give us an overview of what CRISPR-Cas really is, what genome editing means. And he's going to also touch a little bit on the different topics that we will cover during the panel as a general overview. So Mark, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Do I need to switch computers? Yeah, I think we need to change the channel. Which channel do you think? Yeah. The second button on the, on the second one. Thank you. Okay. Okay, excellent. Um, so yeah, basically this is just means to be like a very short introduction of what is yeah, CRISPR Cas9. And also a little bit what is gene editing and how why uh, why we think it's, uh, and basically, why so much in the mouth of everybody, uh, and how it may impact medicine and, and biotechnology. So basically, yeah, this first two slides is about, uh, actually, I have noticed during the, the first, yeah, the, the beginning of the, of the panel discussion that, yeah, basically, we use almost for the same CRISPR or gene editing. So maybe I'll just introduce a little bit with this CRISPR. Um, so basically, um, the origins of CRISPR it's like uh, an immune system of bacteria uh, to fight uh, viruses. So it's basically something that some bacteria use to prevent getting infected. But basically, the researchers will have repurposed the system as uh, what we call a programmable nuclease, or maybe uh, easier to understand, uh, some kind of molecular scissors that can cut DNA in a specific sites uh, where we want. Um, but maybe for continuing, uh, we should say why it's so important to have these molecular scissors. Why it's so important to have the tool to cut DNA in the places that we want. Um, 
So basically, when we cut uh, DNA in most of the biological systems, for example, in the human genome, so the cell tries to repair uh, this cut. So, and there are especially two types of, of repair. So the general repair is what we call non-homologous end joining. So basically, it's a repair that happens in absence of a template. So they, and this process tends to be uh, quite error prone. So normally, when this happens, basically, we destroy a gene. For example, if we want to inactivate a gene, then we program our CAS system to cut that gene. And then, basically, the cell will repair wrong this cut and will have inactivated this gene. However, um, we can also stimulate another type of repair, which is the other, the other arrow, which is what we call uh, homologous uh, homology uh, based uh, repair and basically in this case we force the cell to use a template normally a synthetic template uh, to repair the this break that we have induced so and in this case not only we can break things we can also repair things or for example putting a different base uh, that we want to change a certain a certain uh, feature of a protein or or a regulatory element so that's why important. So a tool to cut DNA enables us to really edit this DNA, either by breaking it or by stimulating it to be repaired on a different, on a different sequence. On a di so, but actually we have known how to do this for, for quite a long time. So why is CRISPR different? So basically in the past we had other types of what we call nucleases to cut the DNA. Uh, but the big difference with CRISPR is that basically we can program it very easily. So in the past, we always used um, what we call like uh, tal uh, nucleases or zinc finger nucleases, that basically these are protein domains that we can program to recognize certain uh, sequences of DNA. However, the big difference with CRISPR is that we don't need to make a new protein per, per, per every new target. So basically, we just decide the sequence, and we encode the sequence in our, in our CRISPR package. Um, and then here, I'm just presenting a very brief scheme of how we do these experiments. So first, we assemble this CRISPR uh, system that basically contains the sequence that we want to target. Somehow, we introduce this into the cell. The cell then activates the system. So basically, it expresses typically a protein, Cas9, which is the protein that basically does the cut. And then it also expresses what we call a tracer RNA uh, or a gRNA that basically is RNA encodes the sequence that we'll need to cut. And then basically these two complexes will go and program the nuclease to cut in a, at a, a specific site into the genome. And then the two things that we mentioned before could happen. Either the cell, if we didn't put any template, will repair by itself and probably will make a mistake. So it will, in, a, in this case, inactivate the gene. Or if we put a template, so in addition to our CRISPR package, we put a DNA template that encodes our mutation, so we'll have basically uh, included, uh, inserted a new base or changed the base into the genome. So um, yeah, probably we have heard so much about CRISPR, like yeah, because it, I think it has really revolutionized uh, genome editing. Um, I think uh, probably it has uh, really impacted by technology for many different reasons. But um, I think the, the main one is the first. So it facilitates genome editing. So it's not that we are. Not so much that we can do new things, but we can do them much faster, much cheaper, and many times simultaneously at many parts of the genome. So now we can even plan experiments where we are targeting all the genes into the genome, which this is uh, completely new. Um, and then CRISPR, in addition of allowing us to, to change genes, we can also regulate genes, so we can in activate, inactivate genes. And then another special feature of this system is that it's universal. So I think it works in all the systems that the people have tried. So in mammalian genomes like mice or, or, or yeah, human, um, elephant. <laughs> it works in plants. It works in a small organism like yeast, uh, in insects, uh, bacteria. So yeah, I think it, it's really one of the, the tools that is more universal in molecular biology. And probably this is reflected in the number of publications. You see this exponential growth since it was sort of invented, although it's difficult to say when it was invented. But somehow, yeah, the number of uh, publications is growing and growing and growing. So yeah, so yeah, it has been selected the breakthrough for many things, also from the journal Science uh, in 2015. 
So, but why do we care so much about uh, gene editing? Um, so probably one of the things that people discuss more about is the potential impact in, in medicine. Um, um, I think there is a consensus in the scientific community and also in the, in the, in the medical community that um, so genome editing is a potential therapy to treat uh, multiple diseases that uh, now are difficult to treat. Um, actually, we already have in Europe uh, one, one treatment that is approved in Germany, which is Glibera. Um, but basically, um, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's a therapy for, for uh, one genetic disease, the, this LPLD. Um, and basically, um, it's basically, in this case, so basically the, the, the patients that have this disease, they have a, a gene that is not well, that doesn't function well. And in this case, what we do with the gene therapy is add a, copy, a, good, a working copy of this gene. Um, so it's done through injections. So basically, virus that contain this copy of the gene that works are injected into the muscle. And in that way, um, yeah, basically the, um, the, 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 the therapy works. Um, however, this is the only officially approved uh, uh, therapy, but there are many others that are really promising and that are in advanced phases. Uh, for example, probably a case that many of you may have heard about is about leukemias. So um, especially very impressive results uh, have been obtained, obtained in, in leukemias. Basically patients, uh, basically in this case, what the, the treatment is about is that the T cells from the patient are isolated. Um, and then they are trained using uh, gene editing uh, to attack the cancerous cells, in this case, uh, CD19 expressing cells. Uh, and actually, this has obtained very good results in, uh, in clinical trials. Um, another sort of famous case that has been in the press is about uh, yeah, bubble children. This is a very serious uh, uh, in immune disorder, so a very serious immune, immune deficiency, basically also caused by um, the misfunction of a gene. It's also a genetic disease. Um, and basically, in this case, again, um, so the editing of cells extracted from the patient and put back um, actually obtained very good results. In this case, 18 out of 18 in the last, in the last trials. But well, I don't know if in the last trials, in one of the last trials. Um, so, they, um, so it worked, it worked well. And these children, they had to be confined in very uh, controlled conditions. So they could improve their immune system. Um, this is what's, what has happened so far. Many things are on the way. So this is just a small uh, graph on the, on the therapies that are in clinical trials. So this is, so probably we will hear more and more about this type of technologies. So basically, um, as you can see, the, we have in the order of thousands of uh, clinical trials uh, on gene therapy. In this, I am breaking out in different types of diseases. You can see that there's a big spectrum, cancer, monogenic diseases, cardiovascular, neurological, so a big number of uh, eye diseases, so uh, a big, many different topics. And then what is the stage? Here I'm showing, of course, most of them are still in initial stages in phase one, but some of them are already reaching uh, later stages. So probably almost every year uh, we'll hear about hopefully uh, new, new therapies. So um, that's most that's almost everything so, um, that I wanted to introduce. So all this technology, of course, will uh, probably have a big impact in our life and in our society. So all this has initiated a very important debate because this is about changing ourselves. Um, well, as I started to say, there is a consensus on the benefits of uh, human genome editing for, for diseases, of course. Well, it exists a moratorium, for example, for more uh, controversial uh, issues like germline editing, so basically in editing the cells that will pass to our progeny. Actually, there is here uh, the results of a meeting by different uh, scientific academies in, that yeah, was held this year, uh, and basically they published the results using basically recommending uh, um, what is the view of the scientific community. Then also CRISPR uh, has the potential to edit uh, not only organisms, also systems. Uh, in this case, I'm showing an example of a gene drive. A gene drive, 
maybe some of you will be familiar about the gene drive. The gene drive is something that is a trait that doesn't follow Mendelian uh, uh, transmission. So basically, in this case, by editing the genome of a mosquito, we can uh, spread the treat of this mosquito all, all over the, the community. Um, experiments in the lab show that this works. However, this is a very special type of experiment which co has its own risks because it's a system that will spread. Of course, it could have very big benefits, but very big risks. In this case, the application was, was, was for malaria, to sp spread mosquitoes that couldn't transmit malaria. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to mention uh, uh, this other point of view. And finally, yeah, more applications that are very con controversial. Of course, gene editing allows us to change many biological functions that could be uh, related to fertility, gene doping, uh, resistance to, to pathogens. So, um, so yeah, I think I'll finish here. So just to, to start to introduce a little bit the topic. Thank you so much, Mark. I welcome the panelists back to the to the table. Any immediate questions? And we are going to dwell into some of these in the discussion, but I want to open in case there are any immediate questions about what Mark just presented. All right. Getting warmed up. I'm going to come back to you guys, so stay with me. Thank you so much. Um, I guess the, the next thing we wanted to do is give a flavor for the actual things that scientists in the community are working on. How are we using CRISPR in our day-to-day -day activities with research? So I was going to welcome, I welcome, uh, I don't know, Cesar, you can get started uh, just telling the, the audience a little bit about how you use CRISPR in the lab. Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about how I use CRISPR and why, why it's important. So uh, for about 10 years, I've been working on uh, alternative methods to treat uh, incredibly resistant uh, bacterial infections. Uh, the reason why this is important is because uh, uh, conventional antibiotics that we have available in the clinic are no longer uh, active against a lot of the, the, the infections that are happening in the clinic. And uh, this is a huge problem. It's been predicted that by 2050, the uh, number of deaths as a result of antibiotic resistant, uh, resistance will uh, amount to 10 million per year world, worldwide if we don't come up with new therapies that are alternatives to, to what we have in the clinic right now. Uh, so I've been uh, trying different methods over the years. Um, and the disadvantage of these methods is that they operate in a broad spectrum manner, meaning that they kill uh, indiscriminately, indiscriminately, they kill good bacteria and also the bacteria that cause infection. Um, and the good bacteria, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but uh, basically they, they're called, they're part of the microbiome and they're uh, commensals, uh, commensal bacteria that live in your gut, for example, and they'll he help you with a lot of different uh, physiological processes. So the huge advantage that CRISPR uh, brings to the table that is unprecedented is a uh, very good selectivity towards uh, specific bacterial species that you want to target. So uh, the, the way I'm using it in the lab is to, to target specific uh, bacterial species that we know are, are pathogens uh, while leaving unaffected bacteria that are part of, uh, part of the microbiome that are uh, good for you, basically good for your physiological processes that help you digest and help you uh, do other things that, that we all need to do, right? Uh, so that would be the, the main advantage of this technology for, for my line of research. And uh, uh, yeah, that's basically, in a nutshell, that's what I use the technology for and why I think it's important. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Cesar. Mm -hmm. uh, Charlie, would you like to tell us a little bit more about your work? Uh, so I work in macular degeneration. So this is kind of the most common kind of blindness in the US. And I use CRISPR in two different ways. So one way is to characterize the disease because uh, there are like two types of macular degeneration. One of them is the most popular, which is the age-related macular degeneration. This is a kind of blindness for old people or grandpas when they become blind. This is the kind of blindness they usually have. And then there is um, a version that is Mendelian. That means that you inherit this disease from because you have a mutation in a gene. And that makes it a good model because these patients, they develop the disease when they are in their 20s or 30s instead of their 60s. So what means is that you can create um, a model to characterize the disease in the early stages because usually the donors are, are after death, post-mortem, so that means it's too late. The disease is really in the late 
stage and it's very difficult to know why this is happening so nobody really knows with CRISPR what you can do is you can create the um, mutation in vitro in cells in ocular cells so you can characterize what going what's going on in the cells after this mutation is there so it's really useful in terms of uh, thinking of therapies because a therapy is usually antibodies or something to knock down or to eliminate a protein or a gene in the cell so with this um, only one mutation that you can create with your CRISPR you can really track down which are your better targets for possible uh, targets for therapy and then the other way I use it is exactly that for therapy so you can actually create a kind of deletion that means that you make cuts as Mark said before with those scissors and then you you uh, damage the genes so they don't function so you can you can know exactly which genes in my case I study complement activation which is a pathway of the immune system and this macular degeneration is caused by the immune system more than by any mutation or, or aging. So at the end, what you need to know is, is exactly which protein or gene in the immune system you need to knock down or eliminate to be able to um, stop the, the progression of the disease. So with CRISPR, you can do that. You can actually knock it down kind of forever because this is something irreversible. And so if this works, that means that you can create a therapy where the, what you do is exactly that in the eye. So the eye is a very specific uh, organ because it's, it's kind of immune itself. It's like it has a privilege and also is somehow easier to target than other organs by yeah, subretinal injections or something else. So you can actually do uh, editing with CRISPR in, in the eye of human people. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Very eye-opening uh, uh, <laughs> description. Thank you, Chari. Uh, Mark, tell us a little bit more about your um, particular uh, use of CRISPR in the lab. So yeah, basically uh, we use CRISPR to address one of the, I think one of the biggest uh, medical, unmet medical needs, which is the, the lack of organs for transplantation. Um, so as you know, uh, there is a big demand for, for organs, for uh, like livers, uh, uh, kidneys. However, there is no way to get the, the number of organs that are needed. So what we are trying to, to do is to humanize the pig genome so that we can produce in pigs uh, hum uh, organs that are uh, basically suitable for, uh, for humans. And basically, the way that we do that is basically redesigning the pig genome, the key parts, so that then uh, there is immune compatibility and functional compatibility between humans and, and, and pigs. Um, and also another issue that we are also addressing is that each, most of the mammals, they contain some kind of endogenous viruses that they are not infectious to themselves, but they could jump across the species. So we also use CRISPR to inactivate these viruses. Fantastic, thank you so much. So you can see guys that in with three different people here, we have from using CRISPR to model a disease and understand better what the disease or how is that working, use it for therapy, using for making a new organ that a human can use. So it's pretty pretty broad application, pretty remarkable. I, w I wonder whether any of you guys, since many probably are using the CRISPR-Cas technology in your labs, anyone willing to share experiences or how you guys are using it? Any cool stuff you are doing with CRISPR? <coughs> no? Pretty shallow audience tonight. All right, no worries. So we'll carry on, but please uh, raise your hand and, and, and let us know if you have any questions. I guess the next thing, we, we see some research applications. Mark's application is actually pretty translatable right away to the human patient. <coughs> but maybe Charis or uh, Cesar's might take a while. So the next thing we wanted to discuss is what are actually the challenges or how are the challenges ahead of us to really make this into a therapeutic clinical applications for patients and how might we overcome these challenges? Um, so Chari, do you wanna uh, start a little bit with, with this? Yep. Thanks. So yeah, although this sounds like super promising at like magic, it's actually very, very difficult. I can say I've been struggling with this technique for over a year and I only recently succeed. <laughs> 
So um, there are like three main problems. So one is like it's not so easy to deliver. So how to deliver these scissors into the organs or cells or because you you think of editing the genome and then you think of a human being and like an adult and that's like when Dolly was cloned that is not exactly what is happening yeah. so you you need to edit like one single cell or like little orga organisms so that is kind of difficult and if you think as I said before about the eye for instance you can actually de deliver this CRISPR in the eye by a subrotin injection but you don't target as many cells as you'd like or maybe the cells that you target are not the cells that you really want to target so it has to be like really uh, well designed and it has to improve a little bit yet or a lot before being used in, in human I would say and then there's another problem which is called the off-target effect that means that um, Mark said before that you program <coughs> this CRISPR with a DNA sequence and this is pretty short, <coughs> it's like 19 nucleotides, so that means that there are many places in the genome where this sequence is going to match. And so that means that in every single place, there is going to be a cut. So if you're cutting, for instance, uh, genes that are suppressor tumors or something that is really important, then that means that you are eliminating these genes. So, and actually this, uh, the problem that is, n it doesn't need to be like exactly the same sequence. It can be like very similar and it will cut anyway. But now there are, so that's kind of being piled now because there are like another CRISPR like that is better, it's more specific and they are eliminating this off target effects. So in the future I say, I think it, it will be fine. And, and then, uh, the other problem I think it could be efficacy, like how efficient this cutting is because even though there is a cut in the DNA, the cells are very smart and then they always repair it the right way. So they always copy what, whatever they had before. So if these cells, if you're trying to fix a mutation for instance, it's not that easy because although you are um, introducing the, uh, a, a strand that they can use to copy as a pattern, they will tend to use their own strand, their own copy. So that means that they will, they will tend to copy the wrong or the mutant allele again. So that makes it difficult um, and that is also being improved. So, so I just want to transmit that it's not as easy as it, it seems. So. Yeah, and I'd like to add a couple of things. So yeah, continuing on with the so the main limitations so of target effects, uh, basically, uh, as, as, as Mark uh, mentioned uh, previously, the way it works, you have these molecular scissors that is a protein that are guided by a small RNA that basically is attached to the protein and guides the protein to the correct place in the genome. Uh, but that's not always the case. Sometimes it goes to a different place where it's not supposed to. That's what we refer to as an off-target effect. And there's been some uh, some advances uh, along those lines to try to improve the way we design these this guides that guide the protein to the correct place in the genome. Uh, there have been uh, some efforts by uh, MIT and Microsoft also using uh, computer programs uh, and machine learning algorithms to, to try to come up with uh, better uh, predict predictive uh, algorithms that actually make better, uh, design better guides. Uh, so that's one thing that match.com of CRISPR kind of. right yeah <laughs> and that was that was just published uh, recently a couple of months ago so so there's a lot of uh, so there's there's a lot of uh, challenges but there's also a lot of uh, people doing research along these lines and they've they've uh, been able to improve the efficiency of uh, of, of of the system uh, very much in the past year uh, the other main limitation that I think it's um, it's a common denominator in all fields, in biomedicine and agriculture and any kind of application with, with CRISPR or any other gene therapeutic is the delivery systems. So, uh, and of course, CRISPR typically is, is uh, delivered as a, as a DNA, a piece of DNA that can be degraded by nucleases in the body. So one main thing is to uh, actually deliver it in such a way that that doesn't happen. So there, there are a couple of different efforts that have been uh, presented in the, by the scientific community, including, for example, we can make uh, really tiny uh, particles called nanoparticles that act as carriers for, for this DNA. So you can 
put a piece of uh, your CRISPR uh, construct or your CRISPR system inside these nano carriers, and you can that basically protects them uh, from uh, uh, degrading enzymes that might degrade the, the DNA. And uh, so that that is one possibility. Uh, another possibility is also uh, so in my field, uh, working with bacterial infections, some people are using bacteriophages. These are these are viruses that only infect bacteria, uh, very specifically. Uh, so they've evolved, obviously, to do this very efficiently. So one thing you can do is you can uh, encapsulate. So these viruses actually have a head, and in the head you can put. Uh, typically, you can put you can introduce DNA and other things. So one one creative idea of, of delivering CRISPR is uh, putting it into the head of the of the virus, and then it will naturally infect the bacterium uh, of choice. And it's actually it's a very selective process. Uh, mo most of these viruses only infect certain bacteria, so you, you can actually predict more or less which bacteria is going to get infected, and it's really, uh, really specific. So that's one way. Uh, with mammalian cells, uh, viruses are also used. They're not bacteriophages, so they're not specific against bacteria, but they're, they're adenoviruses and, and lentiviruses that have also, again, have also evolved to to uh, to infect cells and inject uh, genetic material into cells. So they, they do that very well. Uh, and uh, you know, other options include cationic polymers, uh, for example, pe small peptides that are uh, positively charged, and most cells are typically negatively charged. So there's an electrostatic interaction between the two, and that allows, uh, you know, uh, makes holes in the membrane, and then you can introduce uh, your CRISPR systems that way. Uh, so yeah, peptides, and there's also uh, cationic polymers, but the, the concept is basically the same. So you're uh, by your by electrostatic interactions, you're creating, uh, you're punching the membrane, creating holes so that the CRISPR can easily be uh, easily be delivered. Uh, yeah, those are some of the advances. Uh, there are some other ideas out there, and I think it's a it's a very exciting uh, area of research, uh, actually delivery of CRISPR or other therapeutics into into cells. So thank you uh, so yeah. much. Uh, Cesar and, and Charlie. So we have the problem of delivery, the problem of of target effects, but those seems to be very active area of research to get those improved. I know Mark in his introduction mentioned great progress though despite all these limitations with gene therapy in the field of clinical applications and it seems we are getting closer uh, lately with, with the field and we are in a turning point. But there, are, there might be other challenges that clinical applications uh, have faced uh, in the past or examples. Uh, I wonder, Mark, if you could comment on those. Yeah. Actually, for example, um, yeah, in the beginning, probably the, the cases that I presented were a little bit cherry-picked, <laughs> so some successes to start the discussion. Um, for example, in one of the cases of successes, like the, the CAR T cells, basically the, this treatment for leukemias. For example, in this case, most of the patients uh, actually showed uh, uh, complete relapse of the cancer. But for example, in a small population of the patients, they basically died of an overreaction of their body uh, to, the, to the therapy. So for example, now uh, there are other, other researchers in, the, in this field that basically what they try to do is to program these cells so that they can basically activate the therapy gradually so that then it's more controllable. And for example, in those patients that they have this hyper reaction that basically kills them, so they could like activate uh, very gradually and very selectively. So that, that, that's one, one of the things. And then something very related to what uh, Cherry and Cesar were saying, the delivery is still a big challenge. So probably that's why uh, a big number of the therapies that we are seeing now uh, close, to the, close to the bed are therapies on blood cells. Because the advantage of the blood cells is we can't take them out, we can modify them, and then put them back the part that we want. And that's a big advantage because we don't need to get into the tissue. The tissue can take it out. Uh, however, it's a bigger challenge to um, basically to the therapy in situ, so to put viruses in certain places um, and make um, basically uh, an efficient and homogeneous delivery in, in whatever uh, tissue uh, we are uh, targeting. Um, yeah, as, uh, yeah, basically as Cesar and, and Chari said, that like one, of, one way of doing this is viruses, but these viruses have multiple issues. First, um, they don't get everywhere. And the second thing is that even though we use what we call non-integrative viruses, like for example, this AAB, they are qualified as non-integrative viruses, that's not 100% true. So for example, most of them will not integrate, so the DNA will be around the cell. But in 1%, maybe yes, it will integrate. And this, as Chari said, this could cause a problem because maybe it could break an oncogene, uh, it could break, uh, uh, sorry, a, a tumor suppressor. 
um, and, and, and cause an issue. And, and, and it's true that the of target, or in this case, this n unexpected integration happens <coughs> in maybe in a small number of cases, but when we treat a tissue, we treat a lot of cells. So the chances sometimes to get um, one cell that the thing didn't go well are, are high. So that's why the field keeps in improving uh, on more precise and more efficient therapies. But I think the first, the first probably big successes will be more in these more accessible tissues like, uh, like blood uh, or, or the eye. The eye, I think, is also a very good example. Liver, it's very confined. Liver sometimes too. Mm. Yeah. So, so yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for this. So w we've discussed clinical applications. As you can probably realize by now, this is very helpful for diseases that are caused by a single mutation. You use these scissors, you go, you go in and you correct that. But of course, that's a very powerful thing to do and that might actually open a little bit of a Pandora box as to how far you can really take this technology and edit the genome of a species and make a permanent change, especially going back to the introduction when it comes to an embryo, for example, or to an egg uh, of, a, of a woman. So I, I would like to now uh, give a little bit of the spotlight to Rachel, who is going to comment on what are the ethical implications of using in editing in germline and embryo, how far we can take this and how different communities are approaching this problem. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, I'm so excited to be here. I don't get to talk to scientists nearly as much as I would like, so this is very exciting for me as well. Uh, as Marta mentioned, the big ethical questions are around germline editing of embryos. So uh, Chari's patients are with uh, macular degeneration that they get from uh, their parents that they inherit, we don't worry about a 20 or a 30 year old um, choosing to do this to their somatic cells, but when we're dealing with mutations or changes that are going to be passed on through generations, uh, many bioethicists start to ask questions. So we ask questions about consent. Uh, first of all, you know, there's, it doesn't make sense to talk about an embryo or, or even a very small child consenting. And parents often make decisions on behalf of their children, but is this a different kind of decision? And then we also have questions <coughs> about um, different kinds of concerns about what it does to society. So um, the Gattaca sort of fear has a bunch of different applications. So one is that uh, we might want to draw a line between medical uses of CRISPR, where we know that we're really taking care of something that's, that's a problem, a disease, versus enhancement. Can we make ourselves smarter or more athletic or more creative using this technology? Not now, but maybe in the future. And then relatedly, uh, how do we deal with these questions of unequal access to technology? So we have these problems now, but if the wealthy have access to these and the poor do not, do we fear that we're segmenting society in different ways? And then a related fear is um, for the rights of the disability community and how are people going to be perceived if we're choosing to eliminate some of these traits from the population. So there are a whole range of different questions that different people are asking. Um, and as Mark mentioned, a, a group of scientists have already gotten together actually recently last year and sort of had a, a meeting about this. Uh, this was modeled after the meeting uh, held in 1975 at Asilomar when scientists said, well, we've got this technology of recombinant DNA. This could be potentially very significant for a whole range of reasons. Let's figure out what we as scientists should do ethically and how we should behave amongst ourselves. And so this meeting was very similar. And the recommendations that came out of it, and these are these are voluntary, right? So scientists have sort of said, we think at this time uh, we're not going to go forward in the United States uh, with germline, with research on, on the human germline and in human embryos. Now that's the decision we've made in the U.S., but it's not the decision that everyone um, has made. So uh, as Marta invited me to talk about, in the U.K., they've got um, an entire regulatory body which deals with these issues, the Human uh, Fertilization and Embryology Authority, and they've decided that research 
using CRISPR on human embryos is permitted. Um, but as far as I, I have seen, they've given um, approval to one researcher to do this, and uh, under no circumstances are these, uh, well, I'm not sure even if they're embryos that far along, but they're going to be destroyed after only a few days. Um, and so there's absolutely no idea that they'll be gestated. Thank you so much. Uh, um, Christina, question? Oh, fun. Okay, great. I've sparked the scent. Great. Okay. Uh, so Rachel uh, brought up some very interesting points, and I have a question. Um, so how important do you think that all these bioethical barriers are when it comes to bringing CRISPR to the clinic? What is the weight that this part has? So this is the, the question that all lawyers are sort of afraid of because um, the unfortunate answer is that it may not matter at all unless um, something bad happens. So uh, the example I would, I would give from bioethics is the case of Jesse Gelsinger who um, died in a trial of gene therapy um, and set the field back many, many years because there were, uh, there were concerns in that particular trial about what happened, but whether um, one case should affect the field more generally, it's more likely to happen when you're in one of these fields where it has these ethical concerns than if we're dealing with a trial of cancer, right, in which we sort of expect that not everyone will be saved by the new treatments. Um, so uh, there's also the question of how interested Congress decides to get in this issue, at least in the United States. So um, we're going to have interesting questions about who can fund such research and whether the FDA is allowed to approve uh, therapies using CRISPR and they can be prevented from doing so, um, especially if certain people become concerned about it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Uh, I would also like to welcome uh, other questions here. Okay. Can we yeah, have two? I was no, but it's for the for the video. Rocio, gracias. Okay. It's for Rachel. This question. So I'm going to play the devil's advocate. I'm a physician. And oh, you I didn't take a, a position. I just said what some people think. So my question yeah. is to you. I am going to play the devil's advocate with the yeah. question I'm posing. So I'm a physician, and you said um, the community is discussing that maybe we will use CRISPR for medical purposes, but not for enhancement. And as examples for enhancement, you mentioned making somebody more creative or more intelligent or whatever it is. How is making somebody live longer because you cure them from cancer different in terms of enhancing uh, when you compare that with making somebody smarter or more creative? Aren't we enhancing the length of their life? Yeah, so the line drawing problem of at what point is something a treatment and at what point is something enhancement has always been this really big question. So some people who, um, I think the classic example we talk about is for people who um, may be very short for many years, we'd give them you know particular growth enhancing treatments, but at what point do we say, well, maybe your normal height, your average height, and we might like you to be a little taller. So, so this line drawing um, question is always there. In my mind, it's, um, it's so far from where we are now where we can see people who suffer from these conditions and we know that there's real potential for CRISPR to help them not today, but maybe soon, um, it's premature to have these concerns about what might happen um, in the future for what seems like in any case would be a risky, expensive procedure uh, for use in less uh, life-saving initiatives. Can I add another question? Go on, yeah. So here in the United States, pharmaceutical companies have a big weight on what happens in the clinic. <laughs> and I think we all know this is true, also have a big weight on what's published and what is thought to be scientific-based evidence versus something else. Um, what kind of um, checks can we have in place to prevent this from happening with CRISPR and having pharmaceutical companies driving uses that might be more business for profit than really good applications of a, of a technology? I, I might comment a little bit on that. I, I, at least the, the companies, I think for now, 
the companies that develop for therapeutic applications of CRISPR are actually being very conservative in the most part, and they are focusing in rare diseases, actually a market that is not really usually covered. So I think this is probably a niche that they found because probably in this area, the development will be easier and maybe it, it, it would be easier to develop the technology. So I would say that for now, uh, they are really focusing on somatic mutations in rare diseases. And I don't know, Rachel, if you have comments on yeah, this. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd love to hear more because as you suggested, it seems like uh, CRISPR is right now most useful for single gene mutations, especially with high penetrance, I would, I would guess. And so that's not going to be um, height or intelligence or creativity. That's particular many rare diseases um, for which this is the case. And so this is, um, the first set of treatments we'll see, so we're still getting used to the technology. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah, yeah. I, I, as I said, I mean, and this is so far, there is very little therapeutic application for now in the horizon, but for what I'm seeing right now is focused mainly on these monogenic rare diseases. There might be situations that who told you that you do an application for Alzheimer's and the off-label use could be being having enhancing brain power, it could be, but as you Rachel was saying too, I think that it is not easy. It's not something that you take a pill and just do it. So even that of label use, I don't think is that straightforward. Uh, to whether any criteria are being developed or those check marks, it's it's a good point. I, I guess it's it's too soon to tell, and we are be gonna be discussing also about commercialization later. But thank you, Rocio. Actually, I think the, the case of the, the rare diseases is, I think, a, a very good niche for the new technologies, which I think the simplicity of the, the clinical trials. Uh, so basically, th they are less complex. And then also, I wanted to comment something that I, at least when I saw it myself, I was surprised. So for example, I think there's a big part of the audience that are Spanish. So for example, Hospital Clinic, a, a, a public hospital in, in Barcelona, so we'll start offering this CAR T uh, therapy June next, this, next year. So somehow, uh, it seems that even like, uh, yeah, it, it may become something really available for the, for the public. And in this case, I think it was really a, a medical initiative to, to have this technology there. Um. Do you guys have any, any other comments, Cesar, Chari, or, or Rachel, on, on this, or the general discussion on used in, in embryos or uh, other potential concerns? Welcome your input, if any. I mean, I, I just think, yeah, just generally, I think uh, what they're saying, talking about monogenic diseases, I think that's that's what people are focusing on right now. Uh, and, and anything else is just too complicated at the moment. We're not there. And so, uh, and it's going to take a while, I think, to, to, to sort of uh, try to find a, a solution to, to other diseases, more complex diseases. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's about a balance. I think uh, we should have a, a, a very direct conversation, you know, scientists with with the general audiences, you know, the public and health authorities and the government, I think everyone should uh, chip in a little bit so that we can we can all uh, basically walk together and, and establish the, the different thresholds and the different lines. Uh, because obviously, uh, you know, we've never really been in this situation other than the uh, what Rachel was mentioning in the Asilomar conference uh, when we were talking about gene therapy. Uh, but I mean, this is uh, this is all new for every, uh, all of us. So I think it's important to to establish a dialogue and to 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 see what's what's best and, and what's best for for patients with the objective of, of saving lives. Where I think you know that's uh, that's the most important thing, right? Uh, in a patient that is about to die, how can we how can we help out? And I think that's I think we, most of us can agree that that's necessary or it would be it would be useful to have that sort of uh, alternative. So that's about it. I know Chari had a good example about, for example, consenting children going to Rachel's point, for example, in a blind child. Could you comment on, on sometimes, even though the child might not really realize what he's consenting, he or she is consenting to, sometimes timing is important. So I would love to hear what, yeah, so what you have to say. Yeah, so here we face uh, <coughs> two issues. One is that um, when you're when you're born blind, you don't really know what uh, the world <coughs> look like. So you you used to you are used to be blind. So you yes, actually your brain develops differently. 
and your neurons connect differently. So there was this case of uh, a girl, she was I think 11 or 12, and, and she was about receiving gene therapy, not with CRISPR, but with the old gene therapy, like gene replacement. And then she asked like, what if I don't like what I see, right? So if you've never seen, how do you know? And then maybe you regret, and it's late. Of course, there is no way back. But on the other side, um, if you need to be treated like that, like with CRISPR, for instance, in these cases, uh, the sooner the better, because obviously cells are degenerating and it might be too late if you want to be treated when you are um, 20, so you can really decide. So yeah, so that that's something that you may want to consider before going forward, yeah. Fantastic. Um, I see this was a, a maybe more appealing question for the audience, so I wonder if there are any other questions. And Rocio, thank you for, and Christina, thank you for breaking the, the silence. Any questions on this or comments? No? All right. So can, uh, can I make a comment? Sure, please. Actually, <laughs> this is, so uh, basically, I think many times we see like the genetic therapy as something irreversible. Here I disagree. I think we shouldn't say it's irreversible okay. because I think Sometimes I think it's very good to be cautious, but I think, uh, yeah, I think that is reversible. How would it be reversible, though? Uh, well, the same way that we put a gene, we can So you can break it. To break it. Of All course, right. it's not simple and not ideal, it. but yeah. I, I think. OK. Fantastic. Rocio. Sorry. When you, when you use this in the lab, is it, very, is it, is it a very expensive system? So how is it possible that a medication is a million dollars per treatment oh. afterwards? I, I think here lots of R&D costs go there. Right, I don't right, think right. it's a cost of. The but the actual cost of this technology is pretty cheap, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, basically. Thank you so much. Um, I guess now we are going to go precisely very, we didn't plan this, but I, actually our next point of discussion was who is making money of CRISPR cash? How does this go? Uh, how, how is this technology being commercialized? And here I'm also going to put again the spotlight on Rachel, who has some comments about how technology is commercialized in a more general sense, and the particulars of CRISPR-Cas, which uh, some of you might be aware of. But Rachel, please, thanks. Yeah, so my, my other hat is my patent law intellectual property hat. So I'm, I'm happy to talk about this as well. Uh, Although CRISPR in some ways is naturally occurring, right? It, it, we discovered it happening in bacteria. There are a whole set of patents around CRISPR and around the use of CRISPR in um, eukaryotic cells, not bacteria, but human cells or other mammalian cells, um, and in genetically modified cells of, of various types. And uh, this is mostly a Harvard crowd, so people will, will may know this. Um, there's currently a big uh, interference proceeding between um, the University of California, Berkeley, and the Broad Institute um, over patents that were filed uh, by each institution on, on behalf of the, the star researchers in this field, right, Doudna and then Zhang here. And so to make a, a very long story short and to avoid a lot of the jargon, um, basically, the, the Berkeley patents were filed first, but the Broad's patents issued first, so we're in this proceeding to figure out who owns CRISPR, who has the rights to control these patents. Now, uh, it's a little too early to say exactly what's going to happen, so uh, oral arguments in the case aren't scheduled until November, and so now we're just starting to see uh, what are the motions the judges have decided the parties can file, maybe suggesting that they might be on one side or another on a particular issue. Um, but one thing we should ask is how, how important is this? Why does it matter who owns the patents? And, and what will the effect be on scientists, on patients, on the cost of the therapies that results? Uh, and so one thing that I've been really heartened to see so far is that these patents have been, it seems like, freely licensed to um, academia and to scientists. So there are no constraints on research that's being done um, to, to learn more about CRISPR, to see how it applies to certain diseases and things like that. Um, but what we don't know yet is how different companies, um, if we decide that one of these companies owns the patents, are going to use that. So 
on one level, this is really about does Broad make a lot of money or does Berkeley make a lot of money? But they may choose to control the development of the technology um, at for-profit companies in a more restrictive way. And it's hard to know that. I don't know. They may have, they may have given some sort of statement about it. I haven't seen it. Um, but they could license it to other companies or they could retain it and control the development themselves. So, so time will tell, um, but it, it could be very important for but patients. But th there are already companies that are formed based on these patents, right? Y yes, yeah. there are, and there, <laughs> there are going to be a lot of lawsuits once yes. we figure out, who, well, they may, there may be a lot of lawsuits once we figure out who owns the technology. How long did the patents last? Uh, uh, so patents in the U.S. last 20 years from the date of filing. Um, so these patents are, uh, will go into the 2030s, um, and then there are more that are filed all the time. Um, with that said, it's tough to know how uh, broad some of these patents are, so some of them cover very specific applications of very specific um, strains of genetically modified bacteria. Um, or genetically modified cells, um, but others are much more general um, method patents, and so they will be used for different things. Fantastic. Any any questions on these guys? Sure. So, um, is it possible, for example, that that the whoever owns the patent will license it for free for academia, and then once the research is done and the therapies are there, they can actually charge for the clinical use. So actually it would be like having people working for developing the therapies and then charging for the therapies once they are discovered. Um, there's a step in, in between. So um, what would happen is, you know, Chari wouldn't take her treatment that she's developing for macular degeneration all the way through to um, through the FDA process to market. There would be a company formed that would do a lot of the work, maybe they would be purchased by a larger pharmaceutical company. And so that's the stage at which the, the patent becomes more of a question. Um, and so there they might just say, hey, big company, pay us a licensing fee or a royalty fee, and so we're going to get some share of whatever you make off of this. Um, or they might just say, no, you have to, to sell it to us. Yeah. So in a way, it can become a way of having people develop, you know, until you have a product and then, so it, it's a way of having people investigating uh, and then you will be able to make money out of that once the therapy is developed because then you can actually ask for, for money, right? Once on that. Yeah. Well, the universities definitely they make money on that. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of money. The, so definitely the licenses of CRISPR are very, very expensive. Yeah. Thank you for that. Any other question on this particular topic, guys? or general IP or, no, okay. So I'm gonna open, we have some backup questions, but then if you, we can also continue the questions more one-on-one -on -one during the networking reception, but I wanted to open more generally the, the floor from questions, things that we've talked about, things that maybe we didn't talk about, any, any volunteers or any burning questions in the audience. You have a question? I'm coming to you. Um, I'm, a <coughs> I'm a lay person, so uh, oh, so I, I, you mentioned CRISPR, and then you said CRISPR-Cas. I mean, what 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 is the CRISPR-Cas as opposed to CRISPR? I, I don't yeah. know. It's a very good question. Thank you for pointing that out. Who wants to go with that, Mark? So basically, Cas Cas9 is the protein that does the the job of cutting and CRISPR is the entire system. And the entire system is composed by the protein that does the job of cutting, a molecule of RNA that programs the Cas protein to cut in a specific place, um, and also then where this RNA, this RNA that guides the Cas system, is stored in the genome. So basically, originally, these in bacteria, so the bacteria somehow were using these Cas, CRISPR Cas systems to defend themselves from viruses. So what they did, basically is capture pieces of the genome of viruses, incorporate them into their genomes, and then use the Cas and this sequence to basically to cut the genome of the, the phage when invades, well, the, the virus when invades. So the, yeah, so then the, yeah, Cas is the protein that does the, the cutting, and the CRISPR is the entire system composed by, 
the, the place on the genome where all these things are stored, the, the RNA that directs the cas protein. The cas protein. In this case, we've been using pretty much indistinctively. So it was CRISPR would be the short for CRISPR Cas, and now there are other Cas or the other um, things that are being developed around it. But it's the same for, for the purpose of the discussion. It's pretty much the same. But thank you for the great question, sir. Uh, yeah, I think it's important to emphasize the fact that uh, the, the protein, so the scissors, is always a constant in, in this technology. And the only variable here is the, the guide RNA, so the, the, the actual guide. That's what changes in every case. But uh, yeah, it's important to emphasize that, I think. I mean, now there are other proteins that uh, act as molecular scissors, like Cas, that are called CPF1, I think is so the, the newest one. But basically, within the system, that protein, that scissors, is going to be a constant. So you don't need to change that at all, uh, for even if you're targeting different genes or if you're uh, for, for any application. Fantastic. Questions, Christina? How long do you think that it's going to take to bring this uh, novel technique into the clinic? How many years? <laughs> well, it depends. Some is already, well, not CRISPR Cas9, but gene therapy is on the clinic. Um, I don't know when the first Cas9 based therapy will be there. Yeah, but yeah. sorry, no, no. No, I was going to say, like, like Mark showed at the beginning, there, there are over a thousand uh, different uh, cases or cases in clinical trials in phase one at least, uh, that's huge. I mean, just having over a thousand different uh, different cases, I think it's it's not a guarantee of success, but at least, uh, you know, a lot of them, I think, are going to transition to the next phases. And, and I mean, I don't want to predict the future. I mean, I can't predict the future, but uh, it's definitely very promising, and it's definitely as soon as we've ever gotten to it. Right. I have a quick question. Also, we've mentioned a lot of human applications, but at the beginning, we also alluded to the species application, <coughs> like modified a mosquito to make it resistant to malaria. Um, I was wondering if um, any of the panelists would care to mention, Rachel, perhaps about what the, whether there might be ethical issues around modification of species in this content ecosystem and so forth. Yeah, so there's been a lot of discussion among scientists and bioethicists and, and lawyers and regulators about when we should be using CRISPR in humans, but there's been a lot less discussion of when, when we should use it in animals, in crops, to create biofuels, a whole range of other applications that could be much more, uh, well, A, we could be there much more quickly, um, and then also that could have much greater impacts in various ways. But so we, uh, the favorite article that I saw about this, and I wrote down the headline because it was great, uh, it said, someone will eventually use CRISPR to try to make a dragon or unicorn, was yes. the headline that I read. Um, so, so yes, more humanitarian uses, right? So can we engineer the mosquitoes to get rid of malaria or dengue or Zika? Pick your Someone chosen. Someone was saying that the Zika thing was because the mosquitoes in Brazil had been modified to be resistant yeah. to dengue. I no. mean, there are all these no. conspiracy <laughs> theories out there. Yeah. But there are so many potential uses which could have huge humanitarian impacts. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of more, uh, there are many more opportunities for unforeseen consequences when you're messing with an ecosystem that is much more complicated. The human body is complicated as it is. I'm just one person. Um, the ecosystem as a whole, it's a little scarier when you start to mess with it. And so it might be one thing to engineer mosquitoes so they can't carry malaria. It might be something else to wipe out mosquitoes entirely. Um, or something like that. So there are different different things we could do, and we should have the conversation about them as well. Yeah, I have a comment regarding that. Yeah, I think it even more simple. Not even uh, animals, but plants. If you think of uh, gluten intolerance, so I think it would be great just uh, disrupting or changing the antigen that is because people who can't eat gluten is because their uh, immune system recognizes the protein of gluten as an antigen. So if you can just change this with the CRISPR in the in the wheat, so they should be able to eat it. So that's yeah. kind of it has a nice <coughs> impact in these people who cannot eat bread or those things. 
um, and it's very annoying. It's not like it's not going to kill you, but it's really annoying. So it can be something Even really useful. Probiotics in the non, I yeah. think. So a lot of those things are already genetically modified, and here it is. I mean, we are eating those things already. So fantastic uh, comments. Last round of, conver of uh, questions, otherwise we'll go to question here. We are getting warm up. Thank you so much. Hi, so I heard in the news that uh, CRISPR had just been used to remove uh, HIV genes uh, from uh, cells in the immune system. And I was just wondering if you could comment on, uh, I mean, I haven't read the paper, basically. <laughs> so I don't know exactly what has been done. And, and, and a completely unrelated question is, uh, how do you think um, CRISPR, the effect of CRISPR um, is different from the current techniques used in uh, genetically modified organisms in terms of you know, agriculture and biotechnology. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, so yeah, basically, in the case of the, the HIV, I think there are s several uh, several cases. So one 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 issue is that uh, CRISPR has been used to make the T cells resistant to HIV by changing the basically. Actually, this is quite quite curious. Basically, is by introducing a natural allele that certain people have that makes them resistant to HIV. They can transfer this allele people that don't have it. So that's a, an interesting view, um, which is reusing just nat nature's, nature's natural, uh, natural resistance. But then there is also another approach uh, followed that is a little bit similar to the, to the CAR T cells, but in this case, uh, basically is educating your uh, immune system to fight, uh, to fight HIV. Um, I think that's, that's in clinical trials. Um, I'm not sure why they use CRISPR, but they use uh, genetic no, engineering. I think it was something else, yeah. yeah. the CCR5 for sure. The, this transfer of allele, this has been done in CRISPR. Um, so yeah, that's, that's definitely uh, quite exci exciting. Um, yeah, and then uh, regarding the techniques, I think the main difference between CRISPR and previous techniques is easier. So CRISPR is easy and it works. Um, and we were saying before about the costs. For example, I remember when I started my postdoc, CRISPR didn't exist. So when we had to design a new target, actually we're working with this CCR5, actually with this mutation. It was super complicated. We had to design a protein that basically recognizes the sequence. And every time that we wanted to recognize a new sequence, we had to redesign a protein. A protein in this case was a, tal a talon activator protein. And these proteins are super repetitive. So to synthesize this gene, to design it, uh, was costly and difficult. Now with CRISPR, with $100, we get the target and one week. Well, for the crop co uh, questions, uh, what I would comment is that contrary, in, in traditionally in crops, a lot of the things are done is actually introducing a new gene. And that's why they are labeled as genetically modified. I think the way things are, um, in terms of regulation, actually CRISPR-Cas wouldn't be considered genetically modified because you are not introducing a new gene, you are just modifying a tiny bit. So from a regulation perspective, it's even, it might not even be labeled that way. How they are going to go about it, uh, I'm not sure if there will be new regulations, but that's the main difference contrary to the previous attempts to, to do these things. But thank you for the great question. Or, sir? Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask about the doping. Uh, I believe that the nobody is using that uh, now, but also the agencies that uh, try to fight against that uh, will start thinking about how to find that cases. Not sure if you know anything about that or you have any comment. I think it will be hard catch, right? <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, definitely, it has some potential, uh, and probably I don't know. Probably will be a bit more expensive for the agencies to sequence the genome of whatever cyclist or whatever it is than. So, uh, so, I mean, how could you, I mean, I, I just don't think we're there yet. Yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, but if that was the case, I guess the agencies would have to sequence the genomes of all the cyclists, let's say, and then compare the... And even so, it may be impossible, right? It because be impossible. if it's a natural allele, like this case of right. HIV, who knows if this cyclist had this allele right. naturally or he just inserted yeah, this allele. Well, you could 
it, well, so at, at least in the U.S., we keep, or I don't know, not everyone keeps, but many states, um, they keep the dried blood spot that they take from you when you're born so that they can test you for PKU and a whole bunch of other disorders. And uh, there have been several cases recently involving states that want to go back and look for things that we've only now realized have a particular genetic basis. So, so it's possible that we could test you at birth, and then we could <laughs> test you again later. Yeah and might be able to figure it out. But, but unsurprisingly, some people are uh, concerned about the fact that states have done that. So not, not all states do that. I, I just think, is it, I mean, logistically, um, we might get to a point which this is easy to do, but logistically, how do you do that to yourself? I think it might get a little bit tricky, but it, we might get there, and it's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, any other questions? There in the back. I'm moving a lot, sorry guys. Thank you for the talk. It was very nice and very stimulating. I'm curious about some maybe successful story, at least in mice, where you can actually deliver the system specifically in the brain. Because the delivery system is always the, the big challenge because everything goes to the liver and eventually maybe to Cooper cell or macrophages. It's very, very difficult to deliver it in other places, and especially if it has to cross the blood bar brain barrier. So I wonder if at least technically it's possible and someone is doing it. I, I, I think so. I recently read a couple of uh, delivery options or one delivery option that was able to cross the, the brain barrier. I forget exactly what they use, but I know a lot of people are definitely interested in that. Uh, a lot of people, uh, neuroscientists working on this, I mean, including Feng Sang at the, at the Broad. Uh, so I think and there's been some developments, I just can't, can't, re can't recall right now exactly which technology they use, but uh, there's definitely a lot of effort put into that uh, at the moment. Because obviously, in order to study the brain and, and uh, how it works and, and different functions, we'll, we'll eventually need to deliver uh, CRISPR therapeutics to the site of, site of uh, study. So. What I would add uh, related, and, and, and Chari did mention modeling disease, but in terms of mice and mouse models, really CRISPR-Cas is changing the game completely. Before, when you wanted to do a genetically modified mouse, it would take forever. With CRISPR-Cas, you can really test your hypothesis. What would it happen if I do this tiny change in this gene? And really, the way you, you test your hypothesis and are able to really modify those, those pathways in, in animal models is uh, it's, it's a game changer. And, and it's, it's been huge. Any other comments from the panel? I think, I think another game changer, I think we've mentioned it already, but it's the multiplexing cap uh, capability of CRISPR. So you can, you can design different guides to target different genes that you're of interest, and then uh, you can basically simultaneously target all those genes. So that allows you to do uh, genetic studies, allows you to, you know, yeah, all sorts of, uh, all sorts of things uh, that we couldn't do before. I think that's, that's also huge. Well, this, this was awesome. Um, I really appreciate the participation from the panelists. We are going to have some networking, so we are sticking around, and you can approach the panelists one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. I always like to uh, close with a bang. So my closing statement I would like, and I welcome if anyone wants to volunteer this game, please do so. I would like to hear from the panelists in one or two words, what is the meaning of CRISPR for you now? And how do you see the future of CRISPR? Two words, volunteers in the audience, please raise your hand. Who, wanna get to, who wants to get started with this, Mark? Okay, so I think my two words are transformative and, and universal. Good. Yeah, I would say power and knowledge. Uh, I would yep. say probably disruptive and revolutionary. All right. You can't ask a lawyer to say anything in two words. <laughs> 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 so I, I will try, um, and I have to give the lawyer's answer, which is it depends. Awesome. <laughs> well, please join me and give me a round of applause to our Awesome panelists and also to you guys for participating. Thank you so much.